Well, let's get out our Bibles. We're in a new section of the same message. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught it in just an afternoon. We'll be in it for a year. <laughs> but you know, it does make sense because when you think uh, about how far removed we are from that culture, 10,000 miles away, Western culture versus Eastern culture, as well as 1,900 years. You can read that message and only get half of it if you don't study it, if you don't break it down. And, and it's important we understand what Jesus is saying so we can apply it to our lives. That's why we're here. It's to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his love, his grace, his compassion upon us. He has such words of wisdom for us. Right now, he is indicting Israel for uh, their misuse of spiritual things. The Apostle Paul did this to the Corinthian church. They'd gotten way off in their spiritual life and were using the spiritual things for the wrong reasons, for fleshly reasons, and that doesn't make any sense at all. And so, too, um, the... Uh, people of Israel had, had gotten all their spiritual things twisted around and were using it for, for physical things. So Matthew 6, verse 16 through 18, fast food, fast food. I thought I would talk about something I know a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up in the, the United States, and I was a city boy, I, you know, that was your you know, if you were going to eat out, that's where you went. Fast food. And I was thinking about that. What makes fast food fast food? Have you ever thought about that? You know, what makes fast food fast food? Is it the time, how quick you get your food? You know, they get it to you so fast. If that's true, then in and out is not fast food. <laughs> I've been stuck in that line for 40 minutes one time. It was like 11 o'clock at night. Everybody was coming down the mountain, and it was not wise to get into that line because I don't think they were expecting that rush. But you know, I'm, I'm joking. But uh, also, maybe it's the health reasons. Like fast food is junk food. If it's fast food, it's junk food. If that's true, then Panera is not fast food. I've gotten a salad there, and there's nothing uh, junky about it. It was quite disappointing. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, I paid that much money for lettuce? And that's the other thing. If it's cost, the costs are going through the roof. How do you track what's fast food? When do you go from being fast food to diner or fine dining like Jacques in the box? <laughs> that's a, isn't that a French place? <laughs> do they? <laughs> yeah, they do have French fries. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a long dad joke, isn't it? Fast food, we're totally talking about something different, aren't we? Fast food, that's skipping a meal, skipping a day's worth of food or a season. Uh, could be a week, could be up to 40 days, right? Jesus fasted for 40 days. I, I heard that one guy didn't eat for a whole year, just water for a whole year. I didn't know that was possible. He was very large. So you'd have to go in with a whole lot of extra storage. Um, but this, what we're talking about today has to do with our spiritual life. It doesn't have anything to do with, um, all the books on fasting. Fasting is super popular. You know, there's partial fasting, you know, what do they call that when you just eat one meal a day or just in a window? Is it intermittent fasting. That's super popular helps with health and cancer and diet, losing weight, your body heals itself. There's all kinds of books out there on this stuff. And uh, this has nothing to do with that. It's not about your health, what we're studying here in the Word. Um, Long-term fasting as well is super popular. And there's, I, I had a friend that he actually paid money for this. He went to a camp for two weeks where they ate no food the whole time. They just did a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, I don't know. I wouldn't want to do anything if I wasn't eating food. Um, <laughs> that's kind of prerequisite. But, um, you know, he loved it. 
And he was, this was fantastic. Anyway, I have got to get on track here. What will help us is if we read our text. So we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is teaching his disciples as well as a multitude. And this picture here is of the Sea of Galilee. And this is the traditional site for the Sermon on the Mount. And many moons ago, we discussed this and its location. And where it could have been in a couple of possible places. We don't have it exactly pinpointed. But the traditional spot is so beautiful. And I could see, uh, I could picture myself sitting there listening to Jesus teaching. That would be amazing. That might happen someday. If he decides to, uh, you know, take a break from Jerusalem and give us a different scenery at the Sea of Galilee, we'll all go there. That'll be fun. But as he's teaching his disciples, he's teaching them on the flaws or the foibles of the Jewish culture. The religious life had become corrupted. And so he is addressing this, this spiritual uh, lacking amongst their, uh, their people because it was hypocrisy. You'll see that. Uh, there in the first verse, hypocrisy, that's acting, pretending. It wasn't truly having a heart for God. And so we've been learning about prayer and having a true prayer life, a prayer life that is devoted to God and that reflects God in who he is. And now he switches subject here and talks about fasting, which is a complement of your prayer life. It says this, verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Well, Lord, there's a lot here to talk about, and we pray, Father, that you would lead, guide, and direct us in this conversation, that, Lord, as you just speak to us through your word, that we're, our hearts would hear you and respond. It is a conversation that's happening. Uh, I'm, my voice may be the only one heard out loud, but you're spirit and your spirit's voice is speaking to each one of us and we're responding we're either responding in the negative or the positive and i pray lord that we would respond positively to you today that we would hear your voice and we would do your will so lord lead and guide us in our time together right now we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen amen all righty so Jesus is talking about fasting now, and that is simply to not eat. That's what fasting means, okay? The Greek word, it just means to abstain from food, and it's specific. It's food. Now, there's different kinds of fasting that people will say, you know, talk about. You can fast media. You can fast uh, different things, but food is the subject of the Bible. The Bible is talking about food every time when it talks about fasting, and Jesus is saying here, verse 16, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites. Well, what do the hypocrites do? Well, they put on a sad face. In fact, they went as far as to paint their face. They would literally paint their face with ash, or uh, they take white ash sometimes, or black ash. In fact, the, uh, the uh, Babylonian Talmud that is the Jewish teachings from when their captivity. The Babylonian Talmud says that if you, uh, when you fast, it is holy to paint your face and it guarantees you heaven, this, the, uh, an extra good place in heaven uh, by painting your face when fasting. And so this was a common custom of the Jews that you, everybody would know you were fasting. It, it's, it was a cultural thing. We had this on Catalina, uh, when I lived there, um, our family, we lived there for five years. Um, in the town, the rich guys would wear these really nice embroidered jackets that had an embroidered emblem of their boat because it was such a casual place. Everybody's in flip-flops. Everybody's in swimsuits or whatever. And just really, you know, how do you know who's rich? Y'all look the same. 
So they would literally, in the evening, you'd see these guys walking around, and they would have their jacket with their boat on the back of it. And you'd go, oh, dang, look at that boat. And you could see it on the back, and then you'd look out in the harbor and go, oh, that's his, whoa. And it was a, it was a pride status. You, you couldn't just be a Joe Schmo for a day. You needed to be special, so you wore your, your jacket like that. And this was the way the Jewish culture was with spiritual things. Their heart, their hunger was for God, and that's, that's where they, their attention was focused. And so to be extra special, you would fast. And when you did, you did it in a way that everybody knew. You'd put that sad face on, and mope around, and you would put clothes that were tattered, sackcloth or, or um, just old tattered clothes, and you would put ash on your face. And what's wrong with them? Well, they're fasting for God. And everybody go, whoa. That guy's been like that for a week. Whoa. And everybody would admire him. This is what Jesus is talking about. This custom, this habit in their fasting was not of God. It wasn't taught by God, nor was it godly. He says, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. That's it. That's all you get. You don't get extra points from God. You don't get uh, anything from God. It's just the praise of man. Enjoy it. It's only temporary, and it's only as long as they're thinking about you. You know, and if you care about what people think about you, you wouldn't if you knew how much they thought about you. I mean, isn't that true? You know, we will think about ourselves in the stupid, embarrassing moment that happened to us that everybody saw and we're mortified. And every time we think about it, we're mortified. They won't think about it until they see you again. <laughs> and then you just got to take the humble pie and laugh with them. Okay. Verse 17, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. The Lord says, I don't even want you to show that you're fasting. I want this personal and private between me and you. He said this about prayer. Remember, don't pray on the street corner where everybody can hear you as if this is some great thing. Now, this would not be cool in our culture. You'd just be thought a weirdo praying out loud on a street corner. But in, in the Jewish culture, it was not at all. It was admired because they, they thought that you, you had to be great to pray out loud on the corner. You had to be quite holy to, be, to do such a thing. But they were so wrong. And here's where the Lord is saying, look, our relationship with the Lord is, is supposed to be stem from a private, intimate, close relationship with him. What happens in secret is actually the most important aspect of our relationship. It's not about church and how we come together and rub elbows and chat together and use Christianese, all these fancy words, hallelujah, brother, I'm covered in the blood, it's been a great week, blessed in the Lord. You know, the things that we say that just kind of like to the outside world is like, what? You know, but... It's about that private, true relationship with the Lord and the quiet and the stillness of, of our hearts before him. He sees us. He knows. He says, so that you do not appear to, be, to men to be fasting. Like, anoint your head means to, to, to put on perfume. That was uh, normal for the culture. Baths weren't every day. So you would anoint yourself. So you smelled nice. Wash your face so that you look nice. And it doesn't seem like you're fasting at all. Just walk with joy. You're, you're the Lord's. Let it be unto the Lord that you're, you're doing this. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. He sees, he knows. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He will reward you openly. Now, there's a lot of teaching on fasting today. We've already talked about this, but it's all physical-based. It's all having to do with your body chemistry and your health. And like I said, this is not what this is about. That's not the focus. 
The focus is on spiritual things and God honoring a humble heart and a heart that seeks him. In the Old Testament, there was only one day one day a year that was commanded for the people to fast. So it's an awfully big subject. You know, we talk about it a lot when, when you study scripture. You run across it a lot. But when, it, when you really look at it, God only made this one day. The Day of Atonement was a day of fasting, Leviticus 23, 27. It says, the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. That is a Sabbath. You will do no work on it. You will set it apart to the Lord. You shall afflict your souls. What does that mean? Get out a whip? No. You shall afflict your souls means you don't eat. It's fasting. And offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And so this was a perpetual commandment to the Lord, uh, from the Lord to the people that they would fast once a year. But that's not what the Pharisees did and the religious leaders. Theirs was a a consistent um, pattern of fasting. The Pharisees fasted on Mondays and Thursdays when everyone went to the market. That's because more people can see you on those days. Why would you want to fast on a Wednesday when nobody's at the market? Everybody's at home and in their, their, their agriculture, you know, they're a farm society. So you waited till the farmer's market when everybody gathered together and you walked around with your white moaning face. <laughs> and everybody thought, wow, not even eating on market day. Oh, please. So it was Mondays and Thursdays. That was their tradition. In fact, you read this in um, Luke chapter 18 when the Pharisee is praying there in the temple. He says, I fast twice a week, right? Mondays and Thursdays. I give tithes of all I possess. He's bragging about his spiritual services to the Lord. Are they really for the Lord? Are they really for the Lord? You see, the Lord looks at the heart. You can't, you can't, do these things for men and expect reward from God. That's what he's saying. That's what this is about. It's just being real. I already mentioned this. Fasting is in conjunction with prayer. It's never, ever without prayer. In fact, it's, it, it's well, it's a diet. <laughs> if you're going to do it without prayer, it's just a diet. It's like uh, going swimming in the swimming pool and saying you were baptized. Yeah. yeah, I've been baptized several times this week. It's been hot all week. I was baptized every day. I mean, that's not the way we think of swimming, is it? Nor should we think of refraining from eating food as fasting spiritually every time we do just because we're doing it. I've started fasts in my life where I really had the good intention to seek the Lord. I want to seek you, Lord but I was so busy in my schedule, I had no time. And I just found I'm really not doing any spiritual good. In fact, I'm, I'm hurting myself in my schedule. Remember one time I was at work and I was climbing a ladder. I'm halfway up the ladder and I'm gassed. And I started getting dizzy and I'm like, I better eat something like right now. <laughs> it was like, what good am I doing if I'm far from God in my heart if it's not the season to fast. You'll notice that there's not a command to do this. That's the point. It's it's not a command. You better fast. No, it's when you fast. It's when you fast. And I think there's something there to that point. It's it's God is not saying you have to fast. It's saying you're going to probably fast in your life. Because when something tragic happens in your life, I've noticed that when when uh, someone loses a spouse they get really skinny, like for a season. It's like, it's just, uh, it's not even, they're not even trying, I don't think. I think it's mourning. You go through that painful process of loss or, um, and it's not every time. I would eat, I think. That's the way I react. I eat when I'm sad and I eat when I'm happy. (laughs) So it's always a good time to eat. So fasting is a big, big challenge for me. And uh, I don't just go, oh, I think I'll fast and find myself successful at it. 
I can't tell me how many times I've thought about fasting, tried to do it, and got 10 minutes past my meal, the expectation of my meal, 20 minutes, and I ended up eating twice as much just because I thought I wasn't going to eat it. I'm, I mean, I'm just keeping it real. It's like, I've been, a, I've been a Christian most of my life, and I've thought about these things, and I thought... I would love to fast for 40 days. My Lord fasted for 40 days. I would love to do that sometime. I've tried. I made it 18 days. And I don't think that that was like um, this big spiritual revolution in my life. The Lord's dealt with me and he's worked with me in the area. Uh, here's the other thing is I'll start fasting and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm gonna lose a bunch of weight because that would be great. What does that have to do with the Lord? I've stopped fasting for that very reason because I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. I would rather be fat and spiritually right. And it's between me and the Lord, right? You can't judge me. <laughs> You're not in my head. I'll tell you, you know, there are times when I have been very fit. I know you haven't seen them. You just have to believe me. <laughs> but in those seasons, there's many times where I am so far from the Lord in my heart because I'm all about me and how good I look. And how come you haven't noticed me? Because I notice me every time I walk by a mirror. The vanity starts flowing out of me and I hate it. So, you know, I have an issue. You can pray for me, for my issue. You can fast and pray. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Fasting is not for every prayer. Can you imagine? Yeah, if you're gonna pray, you better fast. We're to pray without ceasing. That's a short life. <laughs> you better eat. But it's dependent on the Holy Spirit's leading, and I have seen this in my life. Brothers and sisters, it's true. I have seen this in my life. There have been times where the Lord has laid on me not just a desire, but a deep conviction to fast. Like so heavy, it was just unshakable. And I've gone into fasting and could not stop because I had no desire to stop. His hand was so heavy on me to do what he wanted me to do. And I can take zero credit for it. Like I said, if I set out on my own strength to fast, I don't even skip a meal. And every meal I have missed in my life, I have truly missed. I missed it terrible. You get what I'm saying. So I'm not one just to skip a meal. So it better be for a good reason, Lord, that you want me to skip a meal because that's a lot of fun that I'm missing out on. In fact, there were Jews who believed if you skipped a good meal that was offered to you, you owed God an apology. You needed to confess that as sin. They were a smaller group. The larger group <laughs> was more into fasting. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't mean in size. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> all kinds of puns today. We're just kind of pulling our brain all over the place. But when they, when they would fast in that culture, it was all about attention, and the Holy Spirit wants us to do it for him and in private and without it even being announced and without any attention drawn to it. I have broken fasts in my life just because we had a dinner engagement and I wasn't going to make a scene. It was between me and the Lord. Okay, I said, Lord, I can't uh, keep fasting without telling these people what I'm doing, and I'm just not going to do that. So I'm going to eat. And then there's times where the Lord will lead you to say something. You know, I'm just saying it's got to be the Holy Spirit. You got to. It's from the heart. It, you watch out for those that that wicked heart that just wants people to think you're more spiritual than you really are or that you're more amazing than you really are, and you just want to live humbly and simply before the Lord. In fact, that's a big part of it. Here's what Matthew 9, 14 says on this. It says, then, then the disciples of John came to him, that is Jesus, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. 
You see, fasting is a, a place of mourning. It's a place of contrition. It's a place of humbling before the Lord. And if that's if you're already there, you're there before the Lord and you're filled with joy of his presence, it's not a time to fast. You know, the God had told the children of Israel several times in their history when they had lost the word of God and then rediscovered it, they would tear their clothes and they would throw ash on themselves in mourning and they would be so bummed out that they had drifted so far away from the will of God for their lives. And then God would send a prophet and he would say, today is a day of feasting and not mourning because you have been restored to your God. And so when I am with the Lord, when I am filled with joy in the Lord and filled with the Spirit and I'm in just having a great time in him, it's not a time to fast. It's a time to rejoice. But when God has placed heavy on my heart a spiritual battle or a work that's, that's needed in my life or in others, intercessory prayer, then God will call us to fast and he will make it clear. And now we're just simply walking in obedience to him and it's between us and the Lord. But you see here, Jesus is saying, why would you show up to a wedding party and not eat? That would be rude. You're putting your blessing on that marriage. And he says, I am the bridegroom and my bride is with me and it's not time for them to mourn, but I will be taken from them. And when I am, they will fast. It doesn't say they better fast. It just says they will. This is, this is a natural process in our lives. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to be humbled before the Lord. There's a time to, to, to take action on that and, and to live in that. And that is what is being focused on here. Many of the great men and women of God fasted for different reasons in the scripture. And let's just take a quick ride through the scriptures and see all of these things that uh, are displayed through their times of fasting. David is the first one I think of. He fasted several times in his life. He, he, remember when he sinned with Bathsheba and she became pregnant and God said that baby in her womb will die because of this sin? It says that he didn't eat for seven days. He mourned and wept before the Lord and he pleaded before God for the life of the child. His servants were concerned about him. They were worried that when the child died, they didn't even bother to tell him. They're whispering about it in the hallway there. I'm assuming it was the hallway. It was outside his bedroom door. Whispering about this, well, what do we do? Do we even tell the king? He seems so unstable. What will he do when he hears his son is dead? So they, David hears the whispering. He says, hey, what's going on? Um, your child's dead. He takes a bath. He gets up, he gets dressed. He's eating. His servants are looking at him going, what, what are you doing? When the child was alive, you wouldn't eat. But when the child dies, you, you eat. You're like doing the opposite of what the world does. The absolute opposite. That, that makes no sense. And he says, look, I, that child cannot come back to me, but I will go to him. I will see him again. He was hoping that maybe God would change his mind as he humbled himself before the Lord. But the Lord's decree was kept. His, his heart was determined on this judgment because David knew better. David fasted for friends as well as for enemies. And that's what we have up on the screen. Psalm 35, 12 David is writing and he's talking about his enemies and he says, they reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. You see, David is saying, even when my enemies were sick and going through a hard season, out of respect for them, I would fast for them in my prayers. I would pray for them. 
Wow, what a heart. That's incredible. Jehoshaphat, well, he had not only himself, but the whole nation of Judah fast at one time. When the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites came together in a coalition against Judah to fight, and this army was way, way bigger than Judah. They knew they were physically outnumbered. In the physical world, they were no match. They were in big trouble. And so Jehoshaphat says, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And it says that Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Now, that's the last thing you want to do before going into battle, is not eat. I mean, you want to hit your protein powders and your high carbs. You want to have energy out there. You're not worried about a diet. You're worried about how much running you're going to have to do <laughs> for the next few days as you're, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's, you know, pretty brutal. But his heart was set to the Lord. His hope was in the Lord. Lord, we don't have a chance. You could win this battle on my empty stomach. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to direct my prayer to you. We as a nation are going to cry out to you for help. And that's exactly what happened. God showed up. He said through the prophet, God wants you to send the choir out first singing. Wow. I would love to be a soldier and not a choir member. To go first into battle? Are you serious? As they came singing, the Lord brought confusion into the camp of this coalition that was against them, and they started killing each other. By the time they showed up, everybody was dead. God delivered them. Fasting was a part of that. Esther. Esther was the queen of the Persian Empire. This wicked man, Haman, had created a law and tricked the king into signing it into law, which could not be altered. And that law said that on a certain day, all the Jews would be persecuted and killed. It was going to be a genocide. Unbeknownst to Haman, Esther was a Jew. Nobody knew she was a Jew. Mordecai, her cousin, who had raised her, says, don't, don't advertise that. Well, it was time. It was time to come out of the closet to be real on who you are. And so in her fear, because she was about to go to the king, reveal her nationality, and when she went to the king, if, he, if she was not invited, it was the death penalty, even for the queen. And so she was terrified. She said to her people, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She says, let's just seek the Lord with all our hearts. Let's leave no stone unturned. I want, you see the heart in that? It's not to manipulate God. It's to set yourself completely over to the Lord. Lord, I'm I'm all here. I'm all here with you. Do as you will. If I perish, I perish. But I'll be in the hands of God. She's putting herself in the hands of God. Daniel 9, same thing. Daniel is at the um, end of the Jewish captivity here. And uh, he sees that the... Uh, Children of Israel are kind of settled in and comfortable in Babylon, and there's no move to go back to the promised land. And Jeremiah the prophet had prophesied that it would be 70 years for their captivity, and 70 years was coming up, and there was no sign of any motivation amongst the people of God. So Daniel, in intercession for his people and for himself, fasted and prayed. He says, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And at first, this was a fasting of contrition. He humbled himself before the Lord to say, Lord, we have sinned against you. 
I don't come before you because of our own righteousness, but because of your great mercies. And he cried out to the Lord, and then the Lord brought revelation to him. He says, I'm stirring it up. It's going to happen, and the Lord did. He brought the people back, but also he gave Daniel a full vision of Bible prophecy, the big plan, the big picture. And Daniel was, he, had, he received more revelation than anyone had it from that time back. Incredible about God's plan of salvation for not only the Jewish people, but the world. And so what a neat, neat thing connected to fasting. And this is what you're going to see as a pattern over and over again. Man, those who really set their hearts to the Lord get blessed in this. Ezra. Ezra is a leader in Israel that was to go back to the land. But the land was laid barren, uninhabited, and dangerous. The road was filled with rebels, guerrilla warfare, attacks along the road. It was so unsafe to travel but he had said to the king, our God is with us. And so he has this problem. He became afraid of the journey. And in his fear, he says to the people with him that to fast. Here's what we read in Ezra 8, 22. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him so we fasted and entreated our God for this and he answered our prayer he's like we've got to go make this journey but I'm embarrassed to ask for help from the king though he could and the king would have honored it but it would have been really a lapse in faith, and he knew it. He's like, that would be embarrassing to say, I believe and trust in my God. He's able to protect me, so could I have an armed guard? That's not, that doesn't, like, work. Here's where his heart was. Let's truly seek the Lord to see that we're right with him, that we're walking in him and we're trusting in him. Let's all fast and let's go on our journey. And it says the Lord heard us. We had no problems on the way. It was a 400 mile journey. Plus, plus it's more than that. A gr big group of people without protection, with carrying all the goods that they had collected from Babylon in the last 70 years. It's crazy when you think about it. God oversaw it. God's all about crazy. He does crazy. Ezra 10, 6. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehonanan, the son of Elishib. And when he came there, he ate no bread and drank no water, for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. Here, Ezra is interceding on behalf of the people who've gone back into sin. They came all the way from Babylon after being chastened, and they went right back to their old ways. And Ezra is beside himself with grief over the hearts of the people, that they're going back to their old ways. And so he fasts and prays here in the house of the Lord for the people and intercedes on their behalf. You see that? There's a good reason to fast for your children and your children's children. When God would lead you to do so, he will anoint that. He'll speak to you. I believe that. We're not, this is not a, a work. This is not something that you, you do like a, a method. I can manipulate God. I can make my children believe if I don't eat. That's crazy. It really is. But if I seek the Lord with all of my heart and I live for him, God will work in my children at my request. And I believe he can turn the tide in their life. And my faith and hope is in him, so much so that I will even set myself aside for prayer and fasting for my children. That's the heart of what's happening here. 
Now, in the New Testament, it's a big part of the New Testament as well. It's not just Old Testament saints that fasted. All of the, there was many people. Like, think about Jesus before he began his ministry. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he went into public ministry. He prayed all night before he chose his, his disciples. Anna, this godly woman who day and night, I think it was 84 years in the temple, prayers and fastings before the Lord, day and night, the Lord honored her and showed her his Messiah when she came into the temple as Jesus was being dedicated. The apostle Paul and the apostle Barnabas were also a part of this same type of work in fasting where God did a great work in them as they sought the Lord. It says this in Acts 13, 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. This is, this is uh, before a missionary journey. This is like, okay, Lord, what do we do next? We've done what you've asked us to do. We've gotten the work done here locally. It's being done. What do you want us to do next? And they're seeking the Lord for wisdom in prayer and fasting. And the Lord spoke to them as they waited upon the Lord and told them what was next. So, wondering if you should move, if you should change jobs, these big life decisions that have a lot more uh, elements of, uh, the, to them that, that could be discerned. You know, when you move, you, it's changing your whole life and your whole culture. When you change a job, it can change things so big, so rapidly. Is it going to really be better? Is more money better always? Or is the quality of life matter? And how many hours you work? There's a lot that you have to pray about. There's a lot to look at. And so, to consider these things prayerfully and to seek the Lord with your whole heart. These are good times to do that. Acts 14, 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They committed them to the Lord. So here's the thing. They're fasting and praying about who should be the elders of the church. Lord, who do you want to lead? Who do you want, who do you want to, to govern or oversee in the church? Fast and pray. It's a great time to seek the Lord in it, to draw in and seek the Lord. We have to do this for a lot of decisions that, that are made. And you can't, not every decision do you fast and pray for. You pray for every decision, but you don't fast for every decision. But here's some examples in Scripture where, hey, this is a big decision. This is going to really affect things. A church that needs a new pastor, that church should fast and pray. Seek the Lord. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect that church in a huge way. Leadership, vision, church vision. What are we going to focus on? Where are we going to put our energies and our resources into? How are we going to be a witness in our community and in our world? Seek the Lord. On these things. Second Corinthians 6 5, Paul speaking of his ministry, he says, the things that he suffered for the sake of the church of Jesus Christ and getting the gospel out. He said that in stripes and imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. It was just a part of his life. Seeking the Lord on a regular basis, just him and the Lord. What God says about fasting. Let's talk about the heart of fasting. And, and Jesus has said, look, it, don't paint your face when you fast. Don't make it a big, obvious thing. Do it between you and the Lord. Now, here's what he says in Zephaniah, or Zechariah, Zechariah 7. Say to all the people, reading in verse 5, say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fast and mourn in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? Wow. 
You see, the Lord looks at the heart. And over the 70 years of Israel's captivity, in the fifth month and in the seventh month, they would do a all-nation fast to the Lord. But he's saying, did you really do it for me? No, be honest. Was it really for me? He's pointing out the fact in this chapter, and he talks about it. Their hearts were far from God. Why, they were doing religious things, but yet ripping off their neighbor, extorting, abusing the poor, not helping, but hindering people's lives for their own advantage and for their own sake, to promote their own business, to make a little bit more money. He says, man, you guys are so far from my heart. You're not seeking me. You're not seeking my heart. You're just wanting me to do what you want. It's for your own manipulation. Lord, bless me. Lord, do what I'm asking. That's why I'm fasting. You gotta obey me. You gotta listen to what I'm saying. That's the wrong heart. This is what he says in verse nine, same chapter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion, everyone, to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. If you're going to fast, fast sin. Don't, you know, how many times do we like say, well, there's an area in my life I know is wrong, but maybe I can counteract it with fasting, or, or counteract it with all these other good deeds that I do. God says, no, forsake your sin. You want to fast? Fast your sin. Give up on doing those wrong things. Stop. It's such a good word. It's, it's, it, we get blinded. We think it's a trade-off. We need the Lord to work in our lives, holiness. I've quit fasting because of sin before, because I saw my heart was totally wrong. It's like, what am I doing? <coughs> Not eating for no good reason. I'm gonna go eat. That's just keeping it real. Isaiah 58. Let's read, let's turn there. We're almost done. <coughs> Isaiah 58. Here's what the Lord is saying to the children of Israel here. He says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Oh, thank you. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. Look, at he's saying, look, there's all kinds of sin going on. And yet, in the midst of all this sin, they seek me daily. And delight to know my ways. As a nation, they did, did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Now, you notice this contradiction. This is what's being pointed out. They live like the devil, but they still seek me for my blessing. And this is where he goes now. He says, why have we fasted? This is what they say. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? What, why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Oh my goodness. They force all of their laborers to fast. They don't have to buy them food. <laughs> Guys, we're all going to fast this week. So I'm not going to provide any meals for you. They exploit the laborers. Maybe they even say, I'm not going to pay you wages because we're fasting. Whatever they're doing, they were using it for their own advantage. Verse four, indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. 
is it a fast that I have chosen? God says, did I ask you to do this? Seriously, did I ask you to do this? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down to uh, bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Here's the fast God wants to choose. This is what its purpose is. What is the purpose of fasting? This is where we get instructed by the Lord. To loose the bonds of wickedness, bound up in sin, fast before the Lord and ask him to deliver you. I've done that. God has led me to do that. It's been a blessing to see in my life these time periods where God will just bring in deliverance where I knew I could not save myself. There's no way I could just pull myself up by the bootstraps. I need you, Lord. I'm desperate for you. That's every day, but sometimes we just need to really go all in and just to really scream it to ourselves as well as to the Lord. The second reason, to undo the heavy burdens. Third, to let the oppressed go free. Fourth, that you break every yoke, every bondage in our lives and in, in the lives around us. Remember, you can do this for others as well. Verse seven, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Isn't that what you should do with your fast? Hey, I have food I'm not eating today. Couldn't I share it with someone else? Give it to them instead. That, you're being, uh, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you c cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. These are the things that God delights in in fasting in devoting ourselves, in seeking the Lord to do justice, to do what's right. And then notice the reward. Remember Jesus said, what you do, uh, if you do this for the Lord who sees in the secret place, he will reward you openly. Here's the reward, verses eight and nine. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. The anointing of the Lord will be upon you. Your healing will shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. You see how God just, he wants to bless, and he wants to minister, and sometimes he's calling us to fast through prayer. It has to be him. You can't just say, oh yeah, it's like a, a genie. Yeah, you don't rub the bottle, you just stop eating and cry a whole bunch. God will do whatever you're asking. That's a two-year-old tantrum. And sometimes those aren't the best to reward. When, you, when the heart is right, when the time is right, when the spirit is leading, when God wants to bring a victory and a breakthrough in an area, he'll show you, I want you to be a part of this and I want you to fast and I want you to pray. Even married couples can fast their sexual relationship but be careful with this one. Look at this. Paul writing to uh, the Corinthian couples, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. You, your body is not your own. You can't just say, honey, the Lord's called us to fast for 40 days. Why are you saying that with a smile? You know what I'm saying. What, you don't like our love life? You can't make it a weapon, a spiritual weapon. I don't have to be with you. No, he says, it must be consensual that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. That word fasting, like I said, that's not referring back to the fact you're not having sex. No, that's referring to not eating. So in conjunction with prayer and fasting, you can also fast your sexual relationship, you and your spouse. When you agree together, that's what's being said here. But he says, but come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say, do it as long as you don't eat. When it's time to eat, it's time to be together. 
but this is just some teaching here on that. I thought I would throw in. It was an extra. Conclusion. We, we did it. Here we go. What's fasting all about? I think this verse right here sums it up. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Fasting is just a part of setting our hearts on the Lord. It's a part of directing our lives to him, saying, Lord, my eyes are on you. And every time I get a hunger pain, Lord, my eyes are still on you. Lord, my eyes are still on you. Let the Lord work this in your life as he wills and as he leads you as a, an arsenal, uh, as a weapon in your arsenal and something he can use to his glory for his name in your life and in others around you. Lord, thank you for this time in your word and thank you, Lord, for the privilege, the spiritual privilege of fasting and we pray, Father, that you would continue to lead and guide our lives, that we would not shut out the idea, but be open to what you would say to us in the Spirit. And may it be for spiritual reasons and not selfish reasons that we do these things. And not, as the children of Israel were doing there in the Scriptures, using it to manipulate, using it as a weapon against those around them. But Lord using it simply for your kingdom, your glory, and your work in our lives and in others as well. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.